picks her up. Here we see Discovery on the launch pad out there. Everybody talks about how things move so fast in the space program. In our case, it took two months to get from T minus four seconds to T zero. <laughs> so that's not always true. <coughs> Fortunately, the weather was just beautiful out there. It was nearly perfect. I think probably the best weather we've had for any of the shuttle launches yet. Here we show the main engines igniting and the twang uh, the orbiter moving was very apparent to all of us in the cockpit. You can see the twang. Those are the bolts firing on the solid rocket boosters. There was no doubt when the solid rocket boosters fired that uh, we were going someplace in a hurry. When we lifted off, uh, we had the heaviest stack that has uh, launched since the Apollo days in Saturn V back in Apollo, over four and a half million pounds lifting off. You see the roll right here. The roll seemed dramatic to us, I guess, because we're on the outside of the stack and uh, the real world was out there. It was a lot more dramatic, of course, than the simulator had been. We were actually carrying the heaviest payload uh, by about 10,000 pounds that had been carried by the shuttle. We had over 47,500 pounds of payload uh, we were lifting. You can see the shock wave right here. It's just behind the, the windows on the top of the orbiter as we're going through the maximum dynamic pressure during ascent. We're actually throttling the main engines back here in two stages to get through the maximum dynamic pressure. As you can see, it's a beautiful day. We had separation of solid rocket boosters and a little film over the windows, just like we'd had on all the previous flights, but uh, not objectionable. As I mentioned earlier, in connection with the SBS deployment, we had a fairly awesome amount of uh, photo TV uh, requirements on this flight. You see the CDR with the IMAX camera. We were fortunate enough to uh, get some good IMAX uh, film of the uh, deploys and a number of in-cabin activities and uh, Hank and Mike Coates get the credit for making that all work. One of the first that uh, Henry mentioned was the fact that ours was the first flight to deploy three satellites and here's the third, the Telstar satellite uh, for AT&T and uh, as with SBS it was absolutely normal, there were no problems at all and Mike and I felt very comfortable doing the task. One of the requirements we had was to, uh, to film using the uh, RMS wrist camera the burn of the perigee kick motor for all three satellites. And in a second, we'll show you the perigee kick motor burn for the AT&T satellite. Notice below on the ground the lightning 
in the clouds, and that was very noticeable, and we're glad we got it on tape to show you. There it is. And it was uh, so dramatic at night that the lightning on the ground would light up the payload bay. And it took me at least several seconds to figure out exactly what it was that was causing the light. And there's the perigee kick motor ignition. In all cases, the motors burned uh, exactly as predicted, and it's a fairly easy task for the crew uh, to monitor that, that burn. And as I mentioned, Judy had to position the arm from the cradle position to the observing position after each deploy. And uh, you can see the AT&T satellite on its way uh, to its transfer orbit, which uh, from our point of view appeared to be nearly in the direction of the constellation Orion, which you see in the upper right-hand corner above the Earth's limb. And we were very pleased with that shot. We thought that was quite nice. And our sleep arrangements looked a lot like uh, summer camp. A little bit of bunks here and there. Two of us slept anchored to lockers. Two of us slept strung across the room, and two of us slept on the wall. And you can notice that in zero G, when you relax, your arms tend to float up. It was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. We didn't always sleep with the night light on. Well, the uh, what shows a sunset is to all good things must come to an end, and you can see some thunderstorms sticking up in the, the limb of the Earth there on the horizon. Sunsets from space are absolutely beautiful. You've heard us say this many times. It's still true, and it's difficult to capture all the color on camera. We had a good flight, and we came We had a good flight, and we came home. Here you see the RCS jets firing as the tracking cameras at at Edwards picked us up a little over 100,000 feet. We had some test inputs that were put in by the computer, 11 sits tests throughout the entry, to get data to verify the aerodynamics of the orbiter. And when those tests went in, it caused quite a bit of jet firing. When the last test was over, at about 0.9 Mach, I took over manual control of the orbiter and then guided it around the head and alignment circle to a, a final approach. As we turned on final, here you'll see some streamers pull off the wingtips as we get the final alignment. Here we're about 13,000 feet picking up speed. We're about 280. Push over into a 19 degree glide slope. Uh, somewhere around uh, 2,000 feet, 1,800 feet, we begin to flare the vehicle out to uh, a more nominal one and a half degree glide slope. At 300 feet, Mike put the gear down. That was a good sound to hear that coming down. And uh, we bring it in then for uh, going down closer to the runway where we break the rate of descent even further. The orbiter flies extremely well. I was quite pleased with it. It's a good solid handling airplane. Brought it in for a landing that we were all proud of and uh, about 185 knots started the nose down. The nose went down per normal. Uh, to us it seemed like it really banged down hard but it always does because of the negative angle tack you have. Braked it to a stop. Took us, I guess, 25 or 30 minutes to get the orbiter shut down. The thing about the orbiter is you're not through flying until you get it all shut down. That takes a while. Got our legs under us and came out and looked at it. It was an extremely clean airplane, as you've probably seen in the pictures. It came through in fine style, minimum tile damage, and the systems on board were in extremely good shape. So we're real proud of it. It's a welcome addition to our fleet. We now have a three airplanes in our national transportation fleet. And I think that we're in a position now that the agency can really go get serious about flying.